I'm moving on to slide number two. I can introduce you right here. Alex is a week, you know, he is an exceptional teacher with using all kinds of amazing technologies within his STEM classrooms. He's a seventh and eighth grade STEM instructor and also a sixth grade math and science project based instructor in the Data School in the Ventura Unified School District in California. Alex started off teaching fourth grade in South and Los Angeles in 2000 and quickly learned that traditional workbook, textbook style instruction was not going to work for him or his students. He attended Pepperdine University for his master's in education and began developing a project based curriculum aligned to California state standards. Subsequently, he moved to Ventura, California, where he went to work for the Ventura Unified School District. Early his career at uh, Ventura Unified, he was able to receive close to a million to fund technology integration for their elementary schools, basically, writing and implementing and enhancing education through technology grant. For the fa past 15 years, he has continued to write grants and to develop and adapt project-based curriculum for his students. Obviously, access to technology has played a huge role in facilitating the project-based approach. More recently, Alex was asked to develop a STEM classroom, both to leverage the engineering projects, which are part of the sixth grade math science curriculum, and to create opportunities for seventh and eighth grade students to continue engineering and inventing in the classroom. Years, the STEM elective has become incredibly popular, allowing students to master CAD, 3D printing, CNC mills, programming, and more. All skills are then applied to the creation and piloting of drones, ROVs, and robots. Alex believes it's a great joy to learn alongside his students as he explore, as they explore all of these new technologies and how they can be integrated with the rigorous demands of NGSS and Common Core. With that, I'm now going to hand it over to Alex to continue with, you know, sharing with us his experiences of creating his STEM classrooms. Hi, everybody. This is Alex Wolf here. This is John. So, I maybe just said I'm going to be talking with you today about uh, not just STEM, but also one-on-one -on -one integration in the school and, and what kind of opportunities that might create. I'm very much looking forward, especially near the end of the Q&A session, to uh, getting to kind of have some back and forth with all of you. And so very much looking forward, forward uh, to being able to create with you guys in the future. So I'll tell you a little bit about the uh, Academy of Technology and the Arts. Uh, just five years ago, the school was ready to be shut down under No Child Left Behind. Uh, we had finding enrollment. We were down to about 400 students. And interestingly enough, uh, on the API scores, uh, our similar school rating was always a, a 9 or a 10, but a 1 uh, when the overall API score. And so happened is over the years, as the letters went out and the school was considering we school that was already a uh, predominantly English learner and, and predominantly low socioeconomic, and it those numbers moved up near the 100% range. Uh, and the district shutting the school down, and instead of doing that, they received a magnet schools grant, and they elected to invest in the school. And the idea was that rather than having a traditional magnet, where you would diversify by busing kids from a school that was predominantly minority out to a school that was not, uh, you would try and lure students in. And where was the one-to-one -one, uh, with Acer notebooks? And uh, in addition to luring students in with that, the district then recruited teachers from throughout who had exuded some some interest in working with technology and who had done a lot of project-based approaches and also then had an influx of new teachers. And finally, one of the things that was really important is that from the superintendent on down with one-to-one, -one, it was made very clear that the expectation was that if school was going to remain open, 
there was an expectation of 100% buy-in from teachers moving in a project-based direction. Uh, the, the teachers agreed to that. The administration supported and backed that. And technology was obviously the one-to-one -one is what made that project-based implementation possible. Today, uh, in just will be our fifth year coming up, close to a thousand students. We have a waiting list of close to 200 students. And the, or formerly the ANZA, now data, has become uh, the most popular middle school in our district. And definitely the one-to-one -one, um, initiative has been a huge part of that. And in addition to that, the STEM classroom and the integration of project-based learning, which I would say is really only possible with one, um, played a huge role in continuing to, to bring more and more, more students and families into the school. So I'm talking today about three different classrooms. One is the uh, STEM class, which was just started. Uh, this will be a third year coming up. And the second is a, a math six classroom. Third is science six. The six and the science six, the school uh, data is on a block schedule. So we do students for 100 minutes um, every day if you have a sixth grade math science, and uh, three days a week if you're uh, for the STEM class. And that 100 minute block is really essential. So if, if you're a teacher or an administrator, and you're thinking about moving in this direction, I can recommend trying to transition to a block schedule so you get those meaningful chunks of time. Okay. The uh, sixth grade math science classroom, and it's like I said, um, and there's no clear delineation where we suddenly say, okay, you know, math has stopped and science now starts, or science stops and math starts. Um, we have right now four main projects that we are doing in sixth grade. Uh, full level. And these projects integrate math and science and have a pretty strong design component and obviously um, significant engineering as well. So a year by having students engineer their wind turbine. And some of the math concepts we weave into the engineering of those turbines are uh, we talk about area of regular and irregular polygons when we're looking at blades. We have a scientific process to determine the impact of the surface area of the blades and the different blade designs on the performance of the wind turbines. We measure output in watts and to do that we measure volts and amps, learn how to multiply with decimals. So that relates to watts and we're also obviously using algebra as we're doing the volts times amps to gather our watts. And um, there's a huge design component. If you see the PowerPoint at the top right, um, they're designing their different gear sets for the turbines. Um, it's not just that they're hopping on to uh, some sort of CAD program like SketchUp, which basic gear and moving forward. We're looking at rotational stability and weight distribution, but we're also looking at trying to make those sets aesthetically beautiful because one of the things that we talk about is that if and figure out a way to make a home-based wind turbine that was um, beautiful to look, and everyone would want them on their scene. And I should add that there's usually an entrepreneurial component to our project as well. So, um, the, the workflow series of experiments that students might do, they might look at, you know, experimenting with two blades versus three blades versus four blades. They use a scientific process, um, measuring again their both and plots, plotting data on a uh, on a chart or on a table, um, and going through the scientific process, writing out their conclusions of what they've discovered with one blade versus two blade versus three blades. Then look at um, whole class data to determine if there are any sort of consistencies that we're discovering and how certain certain curves might have better impact on power output than others. The kids are designing their gear sets. It's kind of an amazing thing when you're using a a note and you are designing your set in let's say SketchUp, which is a CAD program. Um, so go ahead and you, you 
say I would like to achieve a, a let's say, eight to one ratio. In order to do that, you need to maintain a proportional relationship between the radius of your of your two gears. And so some of these concepts that are exceedingly really difficult to teach sixth graders, like proportional relationships and um, like ratios, if a student designs the gears incorrectly in CAD, they can immediately see that the teeth on the gear are not going to match. And what I love about teaching math in this context is that instead of them you know, getting a score on a test, they go, oh, that's incorrect and that's the end of it. Well, no, you, you still have to build a functional gear set for your turbine. So you can go right back into CAD and you can begin to experiment and try a variety of different options and until you finally get to a point where those teeth are meshing properly and you've entered a gear set that, that works. Now on that, um, all sixth graders in the classroom, we have access to seven 3D printers and uh, we have now gone ahead. I've, I've built two more this summer, so we'll be up to nine for next year. And sixth graders, it's pretty incredible how quickly, what took me six months to learn, learn, they learn in, in, you know, about six hours. And they're jumping in and going ahead and, and engineering their own turbines, their own gear sets, et cetera. The second project that we do is uh, so race cars. And again, here we don't use any kind of kit or anything like that. We simply have uh, two panels. And when we're looking at two panels, two sensors, and a motor, and we just begin experimenting. One of the things we do, we look at how the tilt of the Earth's axis affects the energy being absorbed by the planet at any given time. Under NGSS, NGSS is uh, thermal energy. But um, I feel like you can pretty easily transfer that to um, the electricity is being generated on the panel. And so we'll go out and we'll uh, look at complement supplementary supplementary angles. We use that to measure power output from the panels again using uh, volt amps to measure watts at three increments and to find the optimal angle. Once we find the optimal angle, students will decide and they will go ahead and design. Mount oil or race car again using CAD. We like to use SketchUp. 3D print a couple of those mounts, and then we begin to look at um, some of um, atomic structure where we actually discuss okay, how does this photovoltaic work? And we look at the concept of doping a silicon wafer and uh, how doping that silicon wafer um, affects its photovoltaic effect. All these things. There's not a textbook that's out there for that. If you don't have um, a note there, and if you don't have a, a desire to learn this stuff, it's really difficult to do. I would also add that you know a great example in the solar racer project. Some of the more performance-based tasks that we're going to be seeing, or we are seeing already, on the smarter balance assessment. You know, a kid to determine how are with a five to one ratio, um, how many times wheel with a five centimeter diameter will take a one meter track? And if a car that has a five to one ratio, how many times will the motor have to rotate in order for it to cover that same distance? And again, this might sound a little bit uh, Sort of, it's sort of difficult to explain resources, but I'd be happy to share any, any you know, PDFs or any resources if anybody was interested in trying to duplicate this project. This is a type of, of math activity, though, where we're bearing it in where students work in teams and they struggle with this for, you know, sometimes as, as much as 200 minutes. But because the level of engagement is so high, um, we're building these solar race cars, they have no problem sticking with that. And it's been my experience in the past two years that when the Smarter Balance Assessment thing comes out, um, these kids are not at all overwhelmed by some super complex 
performance task. Um, also, not worried about not immediately getting thing. They, they learn to stick with the problem until they can find a great solution to it. Anyway, after the race cars, we move into what's probably the most popular project in the classroom, where students will enter their aquaponic setups. And this was a great project because we actually made this fit in to a larger context with both social studies and language arts. And we partnered with the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And we took a look at um, a through line question of how do we protect and preserve our natural resources. And we looked at John Weir and, and, and Roosevelt and you know different techniques that people have used historically, uh, for example, establishing our national parks. But down to uh, the Ventura River, which happens to be quite close to us, we've been water testing. We look at biotic and abiotic resources and, you know, to figure out the interplay between those biotic and abiotic resources. Came to the classroom and then attempted to engineer an aquaponic setup which would imitate the biotic and abiotic resources. So obviously we knew we needed light. We needed um, we needed um, uh, some media for plants to grow in. We also knew we needed plants and fish, et cetera. But what was fascinating is to, to look at the interplay between those things and to look at how the biotic ecosystem components directly affect how many of those biotic, of those living things, can be supported. And you know, students make extremely strong connections. And then we have an engineering challenge within there where you design something called the bell siphon, which is a fluctuating siphon which automatically raises and lowers the level of the water in the grow bed. And um, by doing that, it, it provides oxygen for the bacteria and also um, allows the plant roots a moment to dry. And I guess I should back up and explain quickly. Uh, aquaponics, if you, if you don't know, the loop system where you have a sort of mutualistic, symbiotic relationship between fish, plants, and bacteria. So what happens is that the make waste in the water, that, that waste is generally ammonia, and uh, that ammonia is converted into nitrite and later into nitrate by a variety of bacteria. And ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate in different quantities make amazing plant food. And so as you build these aquaponic setups, um, you get quickly thriving plants, happy fish, and kids who have successfully bought in a, a river ecosystem and buying it also how essential those those balances and relationships are between those components can make really a really scientific sort of judgment on what they can do to protect and preserve natural resources. What is the impact then of fertilizer washing off of crops and streams, rivers and creeks in our area? What is the impact of other pollutants and contaminants entering into the water? What is the impact even of invasive species entering into the equation, which is a huge issue here in Ventura. Our, our rivers are filled with Orundo and, and other non-native plants. And then finally we wrap up the year in this uh, math science class by planning a mission to Mars. And in the mission to Mars, we uh, do our own egg layers. We personify an egg and become the member of the student's team. The egg landers, which, um, you know, everybody's done an egg drop competition, I'm sure. Our unique twist on it is that we look at the entry, descent, and landing video of the lander, and we have to see to approximate each of those technologies and to explain how it works. So as I said, I have a lot of fun by making the eggs not a uh, fully active member of the team. And he uh, evaluates his team throughout the process so kids can journal from the eggs perspective. And um, again, part of some of the experiments we do within the context of this are we uh, revisit rates by dropping our uh, parents from that distance and testing the rate of descent. We also get to take our, our 
notebooks and we get to go on some and look at parachute simulations and different design ideas from those different parachute simulations on how we want to design our eggs. There's a mathematical component in that there's a you have to purchase all of the things and you try to minimize your use of resources and so they drop conclude with, you know, if your egg survives, um, you rank based on who used the least resources, um, who had the, the lowest budget and moved on to the next level. And at that, um, you can see in the picture in the bottom right hand corner, kids enter their own um, air rocket launchers. And basically you're just using compressed air to, to fire off rockets in a, a lawn sprinkler actuator. But I have pretty heavy amount of wiring, engineering, and other concepts involved. Then they hop on the 3D printer and they design a pin assembly and a pushing so that they can fit a standard SD's model rocket onto that uh, launch tube that you see there. And then we go through the scientific process to try to determine uh, first which launch angle um, will result in which distance. From there, we go to air pressure and its impact on distance. Actually, our, I walk out in the field and drop a hula hoop in the field somewhere between 100 and 200 feet from the launch point. And we can go back into their data and figure out uh, what the optimal angle was and the optimal air pressure to accomplish that distance of flight. After that, we for it. And every year, believe it or not, from a distance of about 200 feet, we have three or four students who are able to put rockets onto the surface of Mars, uh, metaphorically. The, the so those are the four main projects that we do in the math science classroom. And uh, I think it's important to, to point out a couple of things with these projects. Number one, um, you could easily substitute other projects for these. Um, in the past, I built ROVs in the classroom, which are remote control underwater submarines. Uh, looking bigger at uh, integrating a little more art with the math and science through a project from uh, the Exploratorium in San Francisco. But without access to technology, it's pretty much impossible to implement really in projects like this that are also aligned to specific standards and skills um have to be teaching with the Common Core and the NGSS. I imagine that in the next couple of years, as, as I'm, I'm more about NGSS, some of these projects will change, some of them will be substituted, but as long as the access to technology is there, it's really very easy to, first of all, as a teacher, learn whatever skills you need to learn in order to create these things. And um, it's also really easy to create these learning environments where students can hop on the web, they can hop onto a site like Edmodo, where you have assembled all the resources that they need, and they can access all these resources, collaborate with one another, do things in a way that would not be possible without one-to-one. -one. So you're probably wondering at this point about the accountability piece. So um, I know that in, in the general classroom, especially in years past, with No Child Behind, there, there was really a lot of pressure to follow a very strict um, open sequence and to do that by using textbooks and workbooks provided by the district in a, in a very linear um, manner. And so that might be helpful. How do, you, how do you measure these projects? Because lots of times I think there's a misconception about project-based where teacher, many people think, well, we're going to stop teaching for a couple of weeks and we're going to do a project now. And that's not really what project is about. And so, again, having technology allows us to do some amazing things, strong methodologies that I know a lot of us are already using. But you know, with the, the project is what gives context and authenticity, and it also creates a, a need for the kids. Where instead of saying, hey, you know, yeah, you're going to need to understand this five years from now, ten years from now, 
you know, an engineer one day, you'll need to know this. And instead, it creates an, an, an a very immediate need. So, you know, one of the things we can do, I talked earlier about, about wind turbines. You know, one of the great questions, I'm sure you've all experienced it, is, is you know, the students come in the classroom and enter some wind turbine blades. And in order to do that, you got to know how to find the area of, you know, rectangles, triangles, and combinations of rectangles, triangles, and circles. How do you guys know how to do this already? Probably the entire class raises their hands. Yeah, we, we did that. We did that in fourth grade. We did that in fifth grade. We got it. So, terrific. So um, we can move on really quickly. But to be sure, would it be right if I just sent out on your desktop a really quick mini assessment on some of these concepts? And the kids, yeah, no problem. That's easy. So you know, our district uses something called Simplify. I think most districts at this point. Have some sort of base of uh, common or aligned questions that you can access. And one of the downsides is that I think primarily it's used as a um, special assignment or people use it at the district level, but it's not always made accessible to teachers. Luckily, in Vendor Unified, it is. So I can hop on to Amplify. I can find four questions. Uh, maybe, you know, basics. One, just find the area of a rectangle. Two, find the area of a triangle. Three, find the area of a shape that combines a rectangle and a triangle. And finally, four, you know, slightly more complex shape. I can fit that to the students and immediate feedback, which is, I think, really important as opposed to waiting a day or two later. And inevitably what happens is, you know, we present data back up on the screen, whole class data, obviously, we're never... Um, Embarrassing individual students, and you know, the average would be something like 40% on that skill. Everybody says, "Oh, yeah, we all knew that." And so then you say, "Well, you guess we should practice this a little bit." And the way the students are looking at the data, they go, "Yeah, yeah, I think we need we need some help with this." It's important because you know, so many of the students thought to do this before they went into it had a bit of a chip on their shoulder. And I think if you just start teaching, you know, open your books to page 10, and this is what we're going to be learning, then um, there's really a lot of the kids are shut down. They're like, I already know this. We already did this. There's such a big difference between we already did this and you actually know it. And so, you know, when you compare the data with the kids, they immediately see, oh, wow, there are some gaps. And I mean, you can also... You know, the, the, these kids, 11, 12 years old, are amazing at analyzing the data and at looking at each individual question and sort of saying, okay, well, it looks like our coverage on number one, the area of a rectangle, that's 92%. Question two, area of a triangle, whoa, that dropped all the way down to 40 something percent. Oh, and look, everybody who got wrong actually just multiplied the base time based on the area of a rectangle again. And there you can begin to generate. Your instruction. You could look at that data, and you can use that to hop onto another um, Khan Academy. And a lot has been made of Khan Academy, a lot of pros, a lot of cons, but no pun intended. Sorry. Um, you know, I don't think anybody thinks that we should just be putting kids on Khan Academy without a plan and just saying, you know what, just go on and do whatever. But if you have it, that immediately shows you, okay, my students are struggling with finding the area of a triangle up on a Khan Academy and you can design that, excuse me, you can assign that specific skill to the students and it will appear on every one of their desktops so that they know, okay, this is the skill that I need to work on. And you can actually monitor their progress as they're going. You can assign that as homework or you can do it in class. And the alternative is then to go straight into the district guided curriculum and hone immediately on what the areas of weakness. We have another application. I'm sure many of you guys have heard of this called Dino, um, and it was used in many cases just to. What Dino does is it projects an image of all the students' scenes onto the teacher's screen, and so obviously we see right away that it has some pretty good, uh, potential benefits as far as providing safe and secure environment where students know 
hey, you know, we see everything that you're seeing, that already does a great deal to cut down on, on wandering. So what's really powerful about Dyno is that we can then send out really quick checks onto students' desktops where we continue to send out follow-up and immediate feedback and see how are we doing. So we'd be at 40%, try to have a 10-minute lesson, send it out. Five minutes later, we'd see, okay, now we're up 65 or 70 percent. Um, say, okay, I see where you're starting now. Um, then we can go ahead and, and you know have a follow-up le lesson. Sometimes using the entire 100 minutes, where students can see, hey, you know, our class average went from 40 percent to 90 percent. Um, individual level went from 70 percent to 100 percent. They can actually see like really specific evidence of their learning. They know that they can apply those skills back into the project that we're doing. So, um, you know, just a, a elegant and beautiful flow there that that starts to come together. It, it might sound like a lot. I'm sure many of you are already are already doing something really similar to this. But again, one of the the most powerful things about technology is in the classroom. I think is when we explore what new opportunities it provides. And then we've all seen one of the disasters of technology is that, you know, go out and spend millions of dollars and then basically take our textbooks and digitize them, put them on there, and continue doing the same thing. Or, you know, we saw with LA Unified, their iPad, uh, where if you're not exploring ways to use this technology, if you're not looking at what the what the new possibilities are, then it's probably a good investment. But if you are um, looking at the new ways, and if you are using technology um, both for projects and also for Megan for sharing data with students, then you know it, it's almost. It's almost, it's horribly discriminatory against the poor students who don't have access. I mean, the Williams Law suit, which I think was, you know, trying to guarantee that all students had access to the same books. And, you know, while I think it's important that, that all students have access to the books, I think that's nothing compared to, you know, what students at data are now having the opportunity to experience as opposed to students at some of our other schools where, you know, if they're, they're making a PowerPoint in the classroom. Uh, I would also point out that, you know, project-based and having the netbooks create obviously pretty amazing opportunities in construction. One of my favorite things about it is that it removes these barriers. So I talked earlier about an aquaponics project. And uh, the significant portion of our curriculum for that Onyx project is through University of Hawaii Distance Learning and Purdue University Distance Learning. And it's not down at all. Um, we have six figures who are living at uh, a 101 college level, with no limitation, and they're really not struggling with it. Um, also, having the 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 one to one in the classroom allows for great collaboration, not only in the classroom but at, at home, where students are continuing, they're taking their learning home, they're continuing to work in teams. Um, and one of the things, one of the quotes that I really like is that schools oftentimes we don't teach math and science, we teach math and science appreciation. And to the difference between math and science and math and science appreciation is, you know, if you already the answer. Could you begin solving the problem, or you already know the outcome before you conduct the experiment? It's not really science. Um, it it still has these valuable components to it, but you know, one to one with students collaborating on the web, with us to you know, simulations, interactive, and other things, we can take science to other level. And I feel we're doing that in the classroom where kids are doing real science, real engineering. Um, they're taking learning home, and many of them, by the way, are also taking it to the next level themselves. And for us as teachers, I think it's super exciting.
exciting because, you know, even if you have your diet degree in, in biology or, you know, maybe you're on a multiple subject credential, that's my round. You know, limitations to, to what we can learn. Uh, I'm going to talk to you guys in a minute about moving into the STEM classroom. As a matter of fact, I'll go ahead and do that right now. So three years ago, um, as a teacher, I didn't know what a 3D printer was. I didn't know CNC mill was. I didn't know CAD. I didn't know about slicing cells or moving into net fab or any of those types of things. But having access to technology for myself and then being able to share my learning with students through technology, also to learn from them, by the way, um, has put the teacher on a growth curve like you wouldn't believe. And, and just years, um, building my own 3D printers now from scratch and programming in Arduino and uh, building CNC mills from a company called Iboco and having students then utilize the technologies to create some pretty incredible things. So at our school, started a STEM classroom, as I said, years ago. It's interesting. The STEM classroom, I think, is in many ways like computer labs were in the 90s, in that it's a great place for us to learn. And I should say STEAM, by the way, too. It's a great place for us to learn about the science, the technology, the engineering, the art, and the mathematics how they fit together, but really it, it needs to make its way in, into the classroom uh, as much as possible. So I think it's a great stopgap, and I think that's sort of what we did with it at Data, where it was like, look, these kids are in sixth grade, mind blown, they're coming in, there's, some, there's no workbooks, there's no textbooks, they're engineering, they're making all these incredible things, and um, the test scores are, are pretty impressive as well within the context of that. That, um, we want to continue that type of experience for them. So how do we do it? And so the idea was we start this STEM class in seventh and eighth grade. And so STEM class has evolved over the years. But um, what we look at next year is uh, in land. And so we've got four quarters. The first quarter of the year, we learn some of the basic uh, major skills like soldering, uh, CNC mill, printing. Um, we have a series of, of sort of small basic projects just to, to get students to become comfortable using different tools of making. And then we go quickly into uh, Arduino-based robotics where kids are building make blocks, and within that we have a 3D printing component where they have to design a part, there's a series of competitions that they have to compete in with their robot, um, and then the entire quarter engineering their robot, and, and you would just be amazed. The, the difference between the kids who had the project-based environment in the sixth grade and the kids who didn't is so noticeable, where those sixth graders who had that experience, they're fearless in their approach to solving problems. They dive in and they can stick with the problem for the entire 100 minutes. Uh, those skills that, that you know, we're all seeing that, that you know, be on a smarter balance assessment and maybe them isn't so difficult. What's really difficult is the persistence that's required, where a student just isn't used to spending uh, 5, 10, 15 minutes solving a single problem. Well, um, students who are in this kind of STEM-based project based environment, they are used to doing that. We spent, anyway, one quarter building uh, terrestrial robots, uh, programming them, modifying them in a variety of ways, and then competing series missions with those robots. We one quarter uh, ROVs out of PVC pilot pump motors and uh, integrating Arduino microprocessors with those as well. And then Next year, the first time, we will spend one quarter engineering our own drones. 
So I'm working with a company here in Ventura, and I'll be happy to share this information with you as I get it, where we use a, a micro Wii uh, control, kind of like what you have on your, your you have a Wii gaming system. And we had to control the footers of a drone, and we're trying to put together a kit where kids can 3D print their own drone chassis um, and then modify their own code to control the drone, and then again have a series of missions doing that. We're trying to do it all at a price point of about $100. And again, one to one the technology in the classroom is completely impossible. It is one of the places that I find where we have like a, a, a roadblock with some of some of my colleagues from other schools, where you know their um, robot classroom. There is coding. There is no program. It's just, you know, build a line storm robot and then, you know, maybe use some of the preset codes that exist for it. And I can take those things to a higher level. But uh, having the one allows for endless opportunities. One of the projects with some of you might be interested in, if you have uh, music teachers in your school, might have an interest in robotics. If you look in the right corner there, kids a stepper motor and a motion sensor, and we're to design the xylophone playing robot that is calculated so that the distance that you move your hand from the robot, the motor goes to that place and strikes the mallet. So kids playing Ode to Joy in the air conducting that robot with their hand. And uh, again, all the instructions, build on GitHub, um, all the code modification done on student notebooks, and uh, this kind of robotics into the music classroom. I'm also excited next year, I've been looking, there's amazing opportunities to use CNC mills students to build their own guitars. Now, you can go buy a kit to do that for, you know, 120, 130 bucks online, but actually each STEM classroom, you know, you can take a ten dollar piece of scrap wood to build a neck and then a pie baking pan and you can build a pretty sweet guitar and then have the music teacher work with these students to go ahead and write their own music or or just compose some music with them. Very exciting. And then you see bottom left we have uh, our RVs we actually set up a couple of swimming pools in our covered eating area of the school for two weeks at the end of school. Kids go ahead and engineer, build their own ROVs in that. So, again, when we're talking about technology, like 3D printing, we look at things like CNC milling, and uh, in particular an Arduino. I just want to restate that we think of those things in the context of, oh, well, that goes in the in the shop classroom, or you know that goes over in the in this case the, the STEM classroom or in the industrial arts classroom. That's that's a, a good stem point, but every single one of those technologies, 3D print, CAD, CNC milling, computer programming, Arduino. Every load is actually integrated into the sixth grade math science, and uh, I believe enhances the sixth grade math science in many ways. So, um, some of the projects you see there, that's obviously one of our, that's our first 3D printer on the top left there. I can definitely shout out to uh, Airwolf. Airwolf is a company that provided it for us, and one of the nice things that they do is. When you buy a 3D printer from them, they sit down with you and actually show you how to use it. One of the nightmares about 3D printers, maybe you guys have experienced this, I don't know, but people have one because it sounds a great thing to have, but then it ends up sitting on a desk and, you know, sometimes printing out 50 cent toys, but there's not a whole lot of learning um, going into it. Uh, definitely Airwolf can help with that. Also, if anybody wants some... Um, uh, Smaller projects, some um, really accessible projects, wants to learn how to uh, print out different peer ratios or do those other things. I'm really happy 
happy to share any resources that I might have. You also see center there, you know, where kids went from building some of those smart solar cars in the classroom to actually building a solar electric vehicle with a bumping sound system that can drive around. It's a fully functional solar electric vehicle with a charge controller and a stereo system by seventh graders in the STEM classroom. And finally, to our right there, you'll see uh, we had that sixth grade project where we talked about building wind lines. And those two gentlemen right there, uh, along with, with a young lady named Peyton Erickson, they formed a team, got together, and uh, the turbines for a competition here and took it to a exceptional level, which I'll tell you guys about in just a minute. Just a surprise that one of those STEM classroom or STEAM classroom, uh, one of the things is that most of us have a background in uh, programming with Arduinos, and most of us don't have, I don't even think there is such thing as a background um, at this point in 3D printing or a background in, in uh, drones or in some of these technologies. These are all kind of emerging technologies, and without the technology for us, uh, there's no way we're going to be able to stay on the curve and give our kids these amazing opportunities. And without access to technology in the classroom, it's going to be really difficult to provide those kids with the resources that they need in order to go ahead and, and capitalize and, and do these amazing things and do these amazing things in the classroom. Um, and just to give you an example, you know, with an Arduino and, and just the back. An Arduino is just a, a microprocessor. It controls a motor, for example, or can control a light. Um, you know, and so you can you can get an Arduino kit from SparkFun and you can do um, you know a series of missions with it. And that's kind of interesting. But it's way more interesting when you can realize that, you know, the three D prints in our classroom an Arduino micro processor. And you go into the configuration files of that computer and you can modify that in the Arduino um, it's called an IE. It's where you program an Arduino. You can modify that and you can actually make a 3D printer perform better than it did from the factory. And our CNC mills also have Arduino. And you know, kids are starting to learn things at an amazingly sophisticated level where like I said, sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders are, you know, in some cases, I've got students who are building their own 3D printers from scratch. This is something we would normally think, no, this isn't possible for a kid to do until they get to college. Well, not so. Not when you have the access to the information, when you have the one-to-one -one in the classroom, and when you have a, a teacher who's also going to explore these concepts, this is something that's totally possible right now, in the moment. So it's also interesting in that theme classroom when you when you don't have um, the same vulnerability on that smarter balance, et cetera, is that you can really be big flexible with student interest. You saw that, that solar go-kart, for example, that the students built, um, the students who elected to compete in the, in the wind turbine competition could go ahead and do that. There are lots of options for choice. Some kids like to build hand planes, which is a, something that we use, not the woodworking hand plane, but one that we use for body surfing. We're obviously, Cohere and Ventura. Kids like to build skateboard decks, skateboard parks, all amazing things that they can do. Again, not buy a, a book that would compass all these skills, all this creativity, and all of these options. If you have that one to one in the classroom um, and have, have you know free access to things like Edmodo and other places where you can allow students to collaborate and where you can assemble resources for them, basically remove all the constraints and you get kids who are eleven and twelve and thirteen years old doing that nobody would have thought possible just a few years ago. So you know, a couple of things that have happened in the last uh, 
four years since I've teaching at, at Data. So in those four years, we have a, a young entrepreneur competition here where we compete with a Channel University, Ventura College, Foothill Technology High School, um, some top schools. Um, Foothill is actually one of the top schools in California. And uh, we have an entrepreneur competition. Our creators won that competition against the college kids, against the high school kids. They won two years ago. Um, developing their own uh, product ideas, um, build prototypes, and bringing them into the classroom. Then it again last year, um, and uh, this year, uh, competing. Uh, you know, obviously the competition growing every single year. This year they took second and third place against something like 25 high school teams, and uh, just shown out there. And again, I attribute that to. First of all, being exceptional kids, but second of all, to the that they're learning by participating in this project-based learning environment, and their fluency with technology, their understanding that you know ability to communicate because they have technology. So to actually contact people, they were emailing people at MIT and getting responses, um, emailing people in Sheffield and in Oxford. And you know, asking ideas on their projects, and and getting you know primary source information, direct collaboration, and working in teams, to put together these projects, that were just blowing people's minds. I mean, they just did not know what to make of twelve-year-olds stepping up there. And uh, of course, I have bias, you know, because I see them like, like it just I'm always by what they're doing. But in my opinion, giving more impressive presentations showing better types than many of the college kids who were there doing the same thing. In addition to that, you saw earlier a picture of um, a couple of kids building their wind turbine. Pretty amazing where, you know, two weeks ago, uh, a woman went to our school and said, hey, there's going to be a, a wind, wind turbine competition happening at the county fair. It's going to be weak. Do you guys want to do it? I go back to the classroom and say, hey, to do this. Kids immediately set to work, designed the own turbine, we used the bicycle parts and PVC pipes, etc. They in the uh, county competition and as a result of that they were invited to Washington D C. Um, we traveled to Washington D C. In Washington D C pretty amazing we showed up the day before on the prototyping then of five thousand teams that competed only two showed up on the prototyping day. We went into the wind tunnel. The guy said, "Oh, that's an impressive, you know, power push. You guys are doing great." The kids felt very proud of themselves. The other team went into the wind tunnel and put out something like 30 percent more power. They said, "We got this." They high fived each other. They left. I looked at, at my kids. Hey, what are you going to do? Do you want to um, go see the sites, or do you want to um, turn on the turbine? We're going to keep working on it. They immediately set about. Because of those, they have manipulating every single variable um, that they could turbine until they got to a point where they're putting out more power than that other team, winning the national championship, the number one power output, setting a middle school record, uh, number one power output out of 5,000 teams that had been in the USA and Canada, and were poised and worked so well as a team that they were then invited to go and speak at the uh, American Wind, Eng Wind Engineers Association, OWEA, in Vegas. <laughs> it's got in the audio uh, ballroom in Vegas in front of thousands of people and talk about energy to, you know, experts in the field, people from the EPA. And then again, you know, the confidence of these kids, we had used our or notebooks, and we had learned about wind turbines by watching videos of, of this gentleman, Henrik Stiesel, who is the CTO of Siemens um, Wind Energy. So, a employer in the world, this is, you know, he's pretty significant. He's called the, the godfather of wind. After the kids presented, they were going to the trade show booth. We saw Siemens booth, and the kids wonder if Henrik's there. I said, would well, you guys go see if he is? Why don't you pitch him? They had entrepreneur experience from doing other projects in the classroom as well. 
talked to him. They said, hey, could we speak with Henry Diesel? He inspired us. Um, long story short, they managed to get a sit-down 15-minute meeting with the CTO of Siemens Wind Energy, who was so impressed by their their teamwork and their ability to communicate, et cetera, that he gave $5,000, invited them to Orlando, Florida, and gave them a, a three-day tour of the Siemens facility throughout Orlando. So the types of opportunities that open up for this you move to a project-based environment and when you have one-to-one. I mean, I just, again, I can't imagine that these kids coming up in a traditional classroom environment, textbook or book-based, um, isolated skills, not having STEM, not having STEAM, I can't imagine that, that these opportunities would have existed for these kids. Whether it is to win entrepreneurial competitions with some pretty significant cash prizes, whether it is the opportunity to travel to Washington, D.C., um, you know, paid for by um, corporate sponsors, be able to present in Las Vegas, all of these. And this is just in the last uh, four years. So four years of data. seems like every year something along these lines happens. So another thing about when you when you go to the project and when you, when you emphasize STEM is that the community takes notice. And so... Um, it's a bit of a chicken and egg type of thing. I know that a lot of us struggle with finding the thing to do this, but uh, things do fall into place. And when you have these highly engaging projects, people do support them. So again, just in the last four years, we've received significant uh, donations from the Gene Haas Foundation. And we have a whole uh, venture education partnership, which provides funding for innovative projects school, data middle school, you win as many of those grants as the rest of the district combined. MG Computers has been like an amazing supporter. I don't know if any of you are working with um, India and MJP, but things that he does to help support uh, learning in the classroom are, are pretty amazing. He's definitely been a huge, huge help. We partnership with dronefly.com where they've donated phantom DJI um, quadcopter drones that kids can do aerial photography with and that sort of serve as a foundation for the drones that we build. Um, thanks to Acer and Nitty, we now have our own classroom set of uh, Acer Spire next that we're using to power all of our mill 3D printers because we we're having some difficulties um, with the way the ship was configuring them so that students would have to uh, go through a series of struggles in order to get a file to finally print and work. longer an issue. The Society of Manufacturing Engineers has set up and um, the kids have gotten to meet with and present in front of them a couple of times now and they support us in all of our wind turbine endeavors. They've also um, paid for the kids to go to Kennedy Space Center in Orlando, Florida while we were there. See energy, obviously, as I just explained, kid wind. Um, ARG is the company that paid for their trip to Washington, D.C., and uh, Rotary Club of Ventura, finally, as well. Just people in the community get really excited when they hear about these projects. It's just a lot easier for them to, to this, you know, talk about, uh, again, you know, sort of textbook, workbook, Learning it doesn't usually inspire people to give uh, beyond what they're doing through paying tax. And finally, I'm not sure where I'm coming in your timeline wise. I hope uh, I keep you guys too long. But that is uh, the end of my formal presentation. So I just look forward to doing some Q and A and. Um, here, guys, if there's anything I can do there. Thank you. Uh, so, guys, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them. In the meantime, Alex, one request I have received is your contact information. So, uh, um, the best contact me is going to be through email. And okay. okay, if I type in your email address for all the attendees in the chat box. Yes, that would be great. Please okay. go ahead and 
Right, so I'm just going to type in your email address for all the attendees here. And please, if you're still hearing me, please email me because uh, I think it's, it's we make progress when we find a couple of people who we can work these ideas together with. Uh, I've noticed that, especially with learning how to 3D print it. So having a, having a partner, somebody to share in your frustrations and struggles makes a major difference. So a link to any resources you have available. A link to resources. I can... Tell it to me, Alex. I'm. I will email everybody a copy of the presentation, and I will also email a, a link to the resources you provide me with. Okay. Again, most of my resources are posted on Edo, which is a lockdown sort of system for students. So I can gladly, again, if somebody wants to, to email, happily send resources, links, and and do it through that format. Since I'm a little bit in the Stone Ages when it comes to Twitter. I think with that, we come to the end of the session today. So again, everyone, I'm really sorry for the technical difficulties we had earlier today. And thank you again for all your support and patience. And I really appreciate it. Thank you, Alex, for sharing all your experiences. This session was recorded. So a recording of the session will also be available on um, website on the ACL Education website under the webinar archives about three to four business days. Let me open the address once again. I think there are people who are in the question answer chat boxes. So because so before I sign off here everyone, I am going to send Alex's email once again. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me through the ACL Education Twitter handle. And I will also be able to help you through that channel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.